Uh, this piece of research is something we've been keen on for the last 12 months or so. Um, Gareth Stansfield and uh, Saul Kelly um, have written for us an analysis of Britain's renewed interest in the Gulf. And what we're looking at is whether this is taking British defence policy back east of Suez, which would be quite a reorientation uh, if that's true. And it began really with the Chief of Defence Staff's lecture here uh, last year, in which he made some very assertive statements that future British forces would have to spend a lot more time and attention thinking about Gulf security. Nowhere is more important to us than our friends in the Middle East and Gulf. And in line with clear political intent, we would expect, with other initiatives, for JF elements to spend more time reassuring and deterring in that region. I envisage two or more adaptable brigades forming close tactical level relationships with particular countries in the Gulf and Jordan, for example, allowing for better cooperation with their forces. Should the need arise for another Libya-style operation, we will be prepared. This would greatly enhance our ability to support allies as they contain and deter threats and with our naval presence in Bahrain, air elements in the UAE and Qatar and traditional but potentially enhanced roles in Oman, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia would make us a regional ally across the spectrum. I think the press may well describe this as a, a, a bit of imperial overhang. This is Britain with imperial notions of grandeur of going back east of Suez. It's not that. Um, this is not a, a, a military deployment we're talking about. I mean, I would call it a sort of smart presence. The ability to put in place agreements and some training facilities and maybe some equipment which would allow British forces to transit in and out of the Gulf more easily, to operate through the Gulf and to train in the Gulf. Um, so it's not a question of, of going back to two-way family favourites where we have lots of, lots of troops in the Gulf sending messages home, um, but it would be a way of creating a, a structure where our forces um, get used to being in the Gulf and get used to moving through the Gulf and that they don't cause a problem when they do move through, that, that the whole thing is done smoothly and efficiently to the benefit of the UAE as well as to Britain. I think this is, a, this is smart deployment, not imperialistic deployment. And this policy shift, if, if that's what it turns out to be, is precipitated by a number of different factors. One is the, the end of the Afghan operation and the question of where British troops will make the most difference in terms of British defence policy. Um, uh, another is the feeling that we need to do more to stabilise the Gulf. The Middle East is a present in a near meltdown situation and so we should do what we can to uh, reassure our friends, uh, particularly in the Gulf, that we take Gulf security seriously. A third factor is, the, fa is the, the idea that the Iranian crisis is not getting any better and that the Gulf is m likely to, more, to be more insecure in the future and that therefore, again, we should um, reinforce our friendships in, in the Gulf in relation to I Iranian pressure. And not least, there is the sense that the, the, the so-called American pivot to Asia, the rebalancing of American forces to Asia, means that the Americans will not leave the Middle East, of course they won't, but they will express their power differently in the Middle East. And so it would make sense for Britain, even with its very small forces, to have more capacity to operate with the Americans uh, in Gulf operations and perhaps also in the Indian Ocean. So all this is sensible aspirations. And one of the things that our paper says is, well, there's a downside to this as well. There are some disadvantages, there are some risks, to doing this and we'll have to see whether it becomes a practical policy or it simply remains an aspiration of, of Downing Street and the Ministry of Defence. At the moment the most practical aspect of this policy is the things that we intend at the Minhad Air Base. The, the Minhad Air Base in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, is a place we use a lot. We've used it as a transit base uh, to go to Afghanistan. A lot of our forces go in and out of the Minhad Base. It's a very useful area for intelligence gathering. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of good facilities there and we're looking to upgrade uh, those facilities so that we might keep some equipment at Minhad and keep um, possibly a battalion uh, or even a couple of battalions of troops available for training. They could train in the UAE, they might then also be able to train in Oman next door and get some mountain training so that the Gulf provides some quite good training opportunities for areas that, for, to represent areas of the world that we might find ourselves in in the future. Um, the other big aspect of all of this, apart from the Minhad Air Base, is the Typhoon deal. This deal that we are on the verge of doing with um, the United Arab Emirates to sell Typhoon. 
and that will be uh, a centerpiece of this. Now, without the typhoon deal, this, this initiative would still go ahead. But with the typhoon deal, it would look a very attractive initiative. It plays into the prosperity agenda of the government. It will create uh, uh, employment in the United Kingdom, but also quite a lot of investment opportunities and the package that goes around it. You know, when you sell aircraft to a country, you don't just sell the aircraft. You sell a whole system. You sell training. You sell backup and support. And so the typhoon deal would cement a very strong um, uh, or strengthened defence relationship between Britain and the United Arab Emirates. Part of this shift of policy, I think, is driven by our, our fear about what is happening in the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is in, a, is in a very difficult phase at the moment, and there's not much we can do, realistically, about what is happening in Syria, or what happens in Iraq, or what happens between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We, we are not a significant player in those, in those situations. But what happens in those situations will matter to our interests in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Levant, and in the Gulf. And so it makes sense for us to try to, um, to solidify our friendships in those parts of the Middle East where we do have friendships. Uh, the, if, there's a, if there's a maelstrom going on in the, in the core of the Middle East, uh, at least we can do something on the outside of it to protect our interests and to help protect our friends. So in that respect, I think the, the Arab awakening, whatever we call it, that, that, that movement in the Middle East that's been going on uh, since 2011 um, is one of the drivers for trying to be more active in those areas where we still think we can have some political and security influence. I think one of the challenges of this policy shift, if that's what it turns out to be, will be for the government to make it clear to our European allies that this is not an either or, this is not Britain uh, taking less interest in NATO operations or in NATO responsibilities or our responsibilities towards southern Europe or the Mediterranean, that this actually is an adjunct to all of that and that these, these two things can be, can be squared. Whether they'll be able to do that, I don't know. And in a way, we'll just have to see. It's possible to argue that a, a better relationship in the Gulf uh, will actually augment what we can do in southern Europe or the Mediterranean should the need arise and, and our general usefulness as a security ally with our other European partners. It might work out that way. But equally, if something comes up um, and we start deploying to the Gulf for some particular crisis or because of the Iranian crisis, then it may be difficult to persuade our allies that we've not, as we're gone to the Gulf for the, for the sake of the United States and that Britain will again look as if when, it's push, when push comes to shove, it actually goes with the US, not with its European allies. But we'll have to see. Uh, I'm not predicting that, but it's a possibility.